Good morning. It would have been easier had you given me a shorter passage to work with. <laughs> the book of Ecclesiastes says there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Isaiah 61 speaks of providing for those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, oil for gladness instead of mourning. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This reminds me of the Lion King. It's that circle of life thing. I just don't find it very comforting. Not really. Not in the face of death. John's gospel is so much more visceral and so much more profound. Jesus starts with a euphemism. You heard it. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And the disciples blessed their hearts, who would not recognize a metaphor if it hit him over the head, said, Lord, you know, if he's asleep, he'll be okay. I just, just, let's set the alarm clock. So Jesus has to explain, look, he's dead. There's a finality there. And it's with that finality that we typically wrestle or we try to mask it. We say he's fallen asleep. He's gone to be with the Lord. She's in the hands of angels. She's been called to her heavenly home. John doesn't let us get away with that because John takes us seriously. No euphemism masks he's dead. So John tells us that the sisters Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. In other words, Jesus, you love him, do something. At the very least, come to be with him. Or as Martha and Mary say, at the very least, come to be with us. And although Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Yeah, he says he's delayed so that people can witness his glory, but Martha doesn't know that. All she knows is that her brother is dead and her miracle-working friend was not there. And I can imagine Martha thinking to herself, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where were you? Why weren't you here? By the time Jesus gets to Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And it's not like, well, it's been four days, just get over it, get on with your life because that's inappropriate, and we don't. So Martha rails. I like Martha. I have to. I like Martha. She actually reminds me of my mother. I, I've liked her since she fussed back in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus comes to visit her, and Mary's sitting and listening, and Martha's very busy with what the Greek calls diakonine. She's busy with her ministry, her being a deacon, and she says to Jesus, tell my sister to help me. I like this kind of woman. I like her because she says what she thinks, even to Jesus. This is a very Jewish thing to do. I mean, you say what you think. And if you're talking to God, you still say what you think. Abraham challenges God about destroying Sodom. Job challenges God. He spends only two chapters being silent. Then he opens his mouth in chapter 3 and lets God have it. The book of Lamentations, the little Ment Psalms, they rail, they complain, they argue, and they express raw emotion. To tell God, you were not there when I needed you, do something, is not a sign of lack of faith or of disbelief. To the contrary, to lament, to mourn, to demand justice, that's a sign of ongoing relationship. And in the Gospel of John, we see that mourning itself creates relationship. Remarkably, at least it's remarkable to me, that for all John's use of the Jews in a not terribly complimentary way, if I had my chance, I'd take John aside and kind of rewrite part of the gospel. But despite all of John's negative comments about Jews, what we hear in this passage is that many of the Jews came to console Mary and Martha, because in the face of death, there is necessarily reconciliation. We put aside our politics, our family fights, our religious differences, because we all share in mourning, and we will all share in death. So finally, Jesus arrives, and Martha says what she's thinking. Lord, she says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And I think she said it more or less like that. In other words, she's demanding Jesus do something. Her cry doesn't eliminate the love for Jesus. It rather demonstrates the strength of that love because it's a love that can be expressed with all honesty and rawness and anguish. And Jesus reassures her, your brother will rise again. 
Yeah, right, says Martha, I know. Sure, he'll rise in the resurrection on the last day. That's actually pretty much what all Jews at the time believed. On the last day, the day the Messianic age brings everything to fruition, the day when all pain and disease and poverty and war cease, on that day, the dead will rise. The one group in early Judaism that did not believe in the resurrection of the dead were the Sadducees. And whenever you see them in the gospel, they're always introduced by the Sadducees, those who say there's no resurrection of the dead. That's what makes them the outliers, or as we are wont to say in the biblical studies business, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection of the dead, and that's what made them sad, you see. <laughs> yes, well. So Jesus accepts Martha's view about resurrection, but Jesus changes the timetable. He says that he is the resurrection. This is known as realized eschatology. It means that once you accept him, you accept belief, you already have the benefits of resurrection right now. And that's great in metaphor, but what does it really mean? Martha responds, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, but what does that mean when it comes to death? So Jesus says to Martha, take away the stone. And Martha, ever practical, just like my mother says, uh, Lord, <clears throat> He's been dead for four days, there'll be a stink. Well, practical as ever. We can try to preserve bodies. In the Gospel of John, we're told that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea will bury Jesus with 100 pounds of myrrh. That's a lot of myrrh. But they can't bury up death. It doesn't work. They want to deny it, but death will not be denied. And yet death doesn't have the last word, at least in this story. Lazarus, bandages and all, emerges shuffling out of the tomb. He'll die again, of course, but his rising shows Martha that her word of confession has a certain truth to it. Like death, resurrection can be visceral. You can picture it. A number of years ago, I got a phone call from my cousin Jackie. I was living in Philadelphia, and my mother, who insisted in remaining in Massachusetts, in the house where she lived with my father, and in the house where she raised me, had been rushed to the hospital. My husband and I called his parents to take care of our little ones, and we flew up to Massachusetts, rented a car, drove to the emergency room. It was after hours, but we went to intake. I used to be a candy striper there, a volunteer at that hospital when I was a kid, so I knew my way around. I went up to the nurse, the charge nurse, and I said, hi, I'm Dr. Levine. This is Dr. Geller, my husband. We're from Philadelphia. We're here to see Anne Levine. Okay, we're PhDs in religion, but she did not need to know that. So <laughs> she said, oh, doctors, you know, should I, do you want me to show you the way? And I said, no, I used to work at this hospital. We'll just go up on our own. <laughs> so my mother was 80 years old. She had lung cancer and emphysema and heart disease because three packs of cigarettes a day for 60 years does take its toll. She was in a great deal of pain. She was having difficulty breathing, and she insisted that she did not want to be kept alive by any artificial means. So my husband and I sat by her bedside, and we waited. And after about four days, my mother, who was on morphine drip and asleep most of the time, looked up at me, and she said to me, what's going to happen to me when I died? And immediately, without thinking, I said to her, you'll see daddy. My father had died decades before. My mother responds, I look like hell. I said, well, yes, I said, Mommy, y you don't look great right now, but when you see Daddy, you'll look as beautiful as you looked on the day you've got married, because I've seen the pictures. And my mother said, how do you know this? And I said, Mom, I have a PhD in religion. I know these things. And she smiled. She closed her eyes. My husband was sitting on the chair and I was sitting on the bed and I just motioned to him to come sit where I was because I was not in great shape right then. And my husband held my mother's hand and she flatlined about 15 minutes later. And while we're waiting for the doctor to come and pronounce my mother dead, my husband looked at me and said, you don't believe that. I've never heard you say anything like that ever. I'm not even sure you believe in God. You clearly don't believe that. But I looked at him and I said, no, I believed everything that came out of my mouth. I wasn't making it up. I wasn't saying it to make my mother feel better. I was saying what I knew to be true. Martha saw her brother exit the tomb. We can picture that. It's easier to picture than it is to picture Jesus' resurrection. But the idea from the Gospel of John 
is that we're even more blessed if we have not seen and yet we've come to believe. What John says is just, just imagine it. Just picture it in your head. It may be unimaginable to those of us who have difficulty with supernaturalism, but the picture is there. And if the picture is there, we can continue on with that memory and that hope on the fourth day and on the fifth day and on the sixth day until the messianic age comes. John opens the possibility, and that is a gift.